Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you all for joining us. My name is Alyssa Kopinka, and I'm the event coordinator for McNally Robinson Booksellers in Saskatoon. This event is coming to you from Treaty 6 territory, the traditional lands of the Cree, Soto, Dene, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and Métis Nations. Just to note that this event is being live streamed to our YouTube page, so please be aware of the webcam behind you. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the launch of a line of blood and dirt, creating the, Can the Canada United States border across Indigenous lands by Dr. Benjamin Boyd. Thank you to Ben for being here with us tonight and to our guest host, Dr. Valerie Karina. I'd also like to thank the Oxford University Press for working with us to create this event. Dr. Valerie Karinek is the A.S. Morton Chair in History and Research Director in the Department of History at the University of Saskatchewan. Dr. Benjamin Hoy is an Associate Professor of History at the University of Saskatchewan, where he directs the Historical GIS Lab. We will now hear from Valerie. Please give her a warm welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Alyssa. I really appreciate it. Uh, McNally Robinson has outdone themselves again on the on the setup here. People can hear me back. Uh, you know, I use my teacher voice. Perfect. So it's a pleasure to be here this evening to introduce uh, my colleague, Dr. Benjamin Boy. Uh, as you've heard, he's an associate professor. He has an undergraduate degree from Guelph University and an MA and a PhD from Stanford University. Um, and I want to give you a little bit of a overview of why we're here, why we're doing this, because this is in some respects a do-over. We don't get many do-overs in life, but one of the things that we have had the opportunity to do with COVID is um, claim some do-overs, because a lot of our life went on hiatus in the last couple of years, and we didn't have the pleasures of things like in-person launches, and that was a shame. And so today we have an opportunity not only to relaunch uh, Ben Hoy's amazing award-winning book, but to have a chance to hear him read and answer questions about the line of blood dirt creating the Canada United States border across indigenous lands. This is an important book for so many reasons, not the least of which is that it brings a nuanced, critical eye of the US historian to analyzing the off neglected northern US border with Canada. The myths of the Canada US border are known to all longest undefended border, border between friendly nations, and you should hear that in quotation marks, a peaceable border, and the ancient men of Marvel. Like all beloved notions, that's more myth than it is reality, and you'll hear some of that soon. This was and remains a contentious border, particularly for Indigenous people, for Asian immigrants, and as we were reminded just a year ago, a deadly border, where the traffic and human smuggling continues apace, as people's desire to enter the United States is exploited. This book provides brilliantly nuanced context on such topics, drawing upon criminal, legal, media, oral, and statistical data to provide a portrait of what it took to construct this mammoth border, and equally fascinating what it's taken to enforce it, to police it, to surveil it, and create this space. Borders are about keeping people out, defining who does and doesn't belong. They're about racial profiling. They're about emission policies. They're naturally about money, taxes, duties, and land. Before I invite Dr. Boyd up here to speak, I'd be remiss though if I didn't let you know that this book has been incredibly well received. This is part of the reason for tonight's do-over. Now, some of you might know this, but others won't, that academics take years to write monographs, years of archival research, of writing and rewriting, and when published, these works are key to our research contributions. The gold standard, as my historical colleagues like to say, of our craft. This book is the work of an early career historian, and it succeeded spectacularly. If this was baseball, we'd say that Dr. Boy has hit a grand slam. And to date, this book has won three major prizes. Best Book and Political History Prize from the Canadian Historical Association, the Albert B. Corey Prize, awarded jointly by the American Historical Association and the Canadian Historical Association for the best book in Canadian US relations, and the pinnacle of achievement for Canadian scholars, the CHA best scholarly book in Canadian history, otherwise known more impressively. And by all means, we have to get this more impressive title out there as the Governor General's History Award for Scholarly Research. One citation from these awards will have to suffice and is thankful for the one. 
Sweeping in its temporal and geographic scope, the line of blood and dirt offers an audacious intervention in the history of the border between Canada and the United States. By placing particular importance on the people who built or learned to live on the border, including government representatives, members of diaspora communities, and indigenous peoples. Benjamin Boy definitely leaves a complex narrative of uneven development, administrative chaos and control, and multifaceted resistance. A line of blood and dirt makes an extraordinary contribution to our understanding of political boundaries and the people who shape and are shaped by them. You're in for a treat tonight. This is first-rate history, beautifully told, important to hear and to share and reflect upon, Reminder that history is not just about the past. It's also very much engaged in the present, particularly when good histories are engaged in the present. Whereas the jury for the Governor General's Award is student noted, the line of blood and dirt is a powerful and timely engagement between past and present. One that will shape how we understand international and diplomatic history, environmental history, indigenous history, and immigration history. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Benjamin Boyd to the floor. Uh, thank you all for joining me today. It's, uh, it's a real honor to be up here. Um, Dr. Corey talked about a lot of misunderstandings about history, and there's one I want to talk about before I start, which is that for whatever reason, we only put one name on a book, um, but there are over 80 people who contributed to this work in substantial ways, so if you have a chance to read it, please flip through the acknowledgments and see that as sort of a co-authorship list. Um, I think historians often pretend that we do this in isolation, and, and no one does. So it's a real honor to be sharing the room with many of the people who helped make this book a reality. Um, when I was asked to choose sections of the book to read, I wasn't really sure what to pick. I could pick the sections that maybe read the best or the most interesting, but I thought maybe I'd try something a little bit different. And if it crashes and burns, please let me know. Uh, I thought I'd pick the sections that meant the most to me, the ones that were sort of nearest and dearest to my heart. And these came out of mistakes that I made. And so maybe I'll give you a little preface for why these sections were meaningful um, and, and, and why they sort of changed the way I thought about the border or thought about history in general. So the first section is um, about creating the border for the first time, sending surveyors out onto the land. And in this case, uh, the border between the Rocky Mountains and the Pacific Ocean. So a really challenging area to build. And I'd, I'd been looking for all of the Indigenous people who I figured were probably part of this process. We don't talk about them, but they helped build the border in the first place. And I stumbled across this document that I thought was perfect. It had every single person involved who had ever participated in the border, um, and none of them were Indigenous. And so my heart just sank. You know, I, I thought, well, I'm just going to transcribe this anyways. And it's 50 pages long. This is you know months of work transcribing all these names. And for whatever reason, one day I was bored and I decided to just flip a little bit past into the section on supplies. And there in the supplies next to barrels of, of beef, and sugar, are all of the indigenous people who are missing from the section. That is, they're not there in the people section, they're there with the supplies. And that was sort of one of the moments that changed how I thought about the border. And that's sort of the section that I'm gonna read uh, on the first time. And had I not been bored that day, like many historians, I might have missed that section and missed all of the people who contributed in really meaningful ways. So for all the ways that in the international line west of the Rocky Mountains competed efforts of the federal administration, it remained a border without much form. From 1857 until 1868, the Northwest Boundary Team aimed to change that. They surveyed over 800 miles of border and they gathered information across 30,000 square miles of territory. Manual laborers cut through dense forests and hauled supplies. Skilled laborers and technical experts would build bridges, set up astronomical stations and draw maps, and traverse lands that are, quote, almost unknown to both governments. Now, finding a border, marking on the land and making surveyors, surveys legible to distant administrators is unbelievably expensive. The American team alone required more than $400,000 in wages to offset the 120,000 days worth of labor just for that section, just between the Rocky Mountains and the Pacific Coast. The supplies, the provisions, the accommodations, all the other things would add another $200,000 of costs. 
unsurprisingly, scale the operation of scale like this creates a lot of logistical challenges. Utilitarian supplies, including 900 pounds of hard bread, 650 pounds of soap, would mix with chronometers, telescopes, and other technical equipment that are manifest. You gotta take this all with you. And if the surveyors refrained from bringing fully completed buildings looked down, that was only a matter of logistics, not desire. They'd bring all of the pieces. In the fall of 1857, for example, they brought with them 35 windows, 54,000 shingles, and over 40,000 feet of lumber. The surveyors, they came to stay. The surveyors brought with them china plates, cups, saucers, as well as chocolates, assorted jellies, English mustard, and curry powder. Luxury items provided the officers, at least, with a reprieve from the drudgeries of the work. And while some of those items weighed very little, much of what they brought was heavy. 1,400 pounds of sugar from Sandwich Island, 710 pounds of crushed sugar, 46 gallons of Sandwich Island syrup, all purchased from a single individual in 1857. These surveyors are packing for utility, they're packing for pleasure. But undesired contingencies never strayed far from their mind. In the medical kits, they bring bullet forceps and penis syringes used in the treatment of syphilis. Unsure if they would be fighting or fornicating, they erred on the side of caution to prepare for both. Now, both countries imagined this border to be clear and without ambiguity. And for the people who tried to make this vision a reality, border making practice was miserable work. You had complications and discomforts, you had setbacks that would mire the process. There are steep mountains and dense forests that would mix with persistent rain, the tedious marches and unexpected dangers. Swarms of mosquitoes became known to the surveyors as, quote, our tormentors, and would take advantage of the men's helplessness as they carried hundreds of pounds of deer through forests and rivers and woods. Tired of long treks and a limited diet, the laborers themselves would stop at any chance they get. They delayed marches, for example, to feast on huckleberries and other fruit that they came across. To make matters worse, in 1858, gold is discovered on the Fraser River, changing the entire logistics of the survey. In just four months, 30,000 settlers would flood the Fraser River, cripple the regional military and commercial ventures that depended on labor because they offered better wages. Or still, the, American, the influx of American settlers would threaten to destabilize the entire region. Britain would establish the colony of British Columbia in 1858, would expand its administration, would send gunboats up into the coast and troops to help enforce order in its new colony. But the creation of the colony, for all it did, didn't reduce the friction between the United States or Britain. And for the Stalo, whose territory this is, the challenges brought by a sudden demographic upheaval were even harder to ignore. The Zuitlam, the starving ones as the Stolo, Stolo knew them, would bring disease. They also destroyed longhouses and excavated rivers where the Stalo made their summer residences. Now the Stalo had participated in the gold rush in the past, the gold trade in the past, and as before, they would take advantage of some of the opportunities that it would create. They worked as guides, provisioners, packers, freighters, and they'd conduct their own mining operations. So while the gold rush provided the Stalo and others with opportunities, they couldn't ignore the miners' disrespect of their territory or the overlaps between productive mining claims and the salmon, and salmon fishing and processing sites. The miners' militancy would peak with the destruction of five indigenous settlements in Spuzzum, which would require immediate action. Now for Britain and the United States, the miners' attack and Astalo's response provided an unsettling reminder of how little control they maintained on the coast as they prepared to define and defend their shared border. Neither country could control the movement of miners, neither country could control their attacks, nor could they control the peace that would follow. According to oral accounts by Elder Patrick Charlie, Astalo, the Astalo chief of Twitlington, and Major Snyder, who's a, a leading miner, would establish a peace agreement long before the British colonial office would respond to any of this. 
That is the lag time between local problems and colonial responses would create an environment where regional solutions flourish. For the survey teams themselves, the gold rush drove up the prices of labor and supplies causing considerable delay, embarrassment, and additional expenses in their operation. To make matters worse, the American Civil War then erupts. A few years later, diverting all of the resources that would have been put into a border survey into other things. Now, building borders in a region in which neither country had much control or much knowledge required a mixture of this unbridled optimism as well as legions of orders. When mixed correctly, however, this could be a really potent instrument. Unskilled laborers and transporters measured in either days worked or people employed did the bulk of the work making a border. But it's fundamentally a, a large part of it is unskilled labor. Axemen on the American team, so these are the people cutting the trees, spent a little, a little under 8,800 days cutting down trees on either side of the border, so it is visible for someone who comes across it, right? You can imagine you're putting boundary stones in the middle of a forest. People could just walk by them. They're a mile or two apart. Technical, and ex technical experts and administrators are a much smaller contingent of the force, but they receive the bulk of the pay. So survey teams are sort of the vanguard of federal power on the Pacific coast. It's a power that's always reliant on local cooperation. American surveyors, for example, were drawn indigenous guides and provisioners in the Great Lakes during the early 19th century. They'd rely on them when they're surveying the border with Mexico. As they're approaching the Pacific, here too, indigenous laborers would do much of the work. Estalo, Semiamu, Bami, Nooksack, Colville, and others would provide the survey teams with saddles, canoes, sleighs, planks of wood, and a wide array of food. They'd pilot steamers and ferry parties across the Chilliwack River. They'd care for the animals, they'd rent out their cabins, and they served as guides. Most of all, they provided crucial information and allowed British and American surveyors to pass through their territory unmolested. It's unclear how many took part. The United States team on its own likely hired between two and 300 indigenous laborers, although inconsistencies in the way they reported information mean as few as 150 and perhaps as many as 600 took part. Skako, for example, worked for the boundary survey team as an expressman, a packer, a laborer, and a transporter on at least 15 different occasions. Skako served as a representative for groups of laborers ranging from six to 39 people. The individual Skako recruited on each team likely overlapped, but the boundary commission's records make these discerning these patterns impossible. In many instances, it recorded them simply as Indians, leaving out their name, their gender, days worked, rates of pay, and even the exact number of people employed. What they did note, however, suggests that indigenous laborers work primarily in the transportation side of things. Many received a dollar a day for their labor, 50 cents a day for their canoes, a rate that would put them on par um, with uh, non-indigenous laborers. While the boundary survey team employed at least two indigenous women, the unnamed wives of Lahash and Lahark as transporters it intentionally avoided the practice wherever possible. When Tuk Tuk refused to join the survey party unless a female companion accompanied him, Henry Custer, who's one of the team's topographers, replaced him with, quote, a more reflective Indian. Custer feared that the disturbance with which these damsels produced in the party by their willful and extent of influence over strong companions would be a significant impediment to the party's progress. Considered together, indigenous people provided roughly six and a half percent of the days of labor noted in the Northwest Boundary Survey's records. But their labor actually mattered quite a bit more than that number suggests. In 1859, as the Joint Boundary Commission surveyed the Northern Cascade Mountains in present day Washington State, they would draw on the maps created by Thusselot and his father. Both men provided information on the pertinent river systems the surveyors would encounter, as well as their Halkamalem place names. That they would pass through. Indigenous guides and laborers would carry messages between the astronomical station and would serve as the backbone of communication. They would portage heavy canoes across obstructed terrain, hunted, fished, and gathered food as necessary for the survey's success. Nooksack men would construct river canoes in the field, 
allowing surveyors to explore without having to drag or portage these canyons the entire distance. In regions uh, such as along the interior portion of the Cascade Mountain, the reconnaissance teams would require Indigenous guides and carriers. Henry Custer, for example, believed that Indigenous people that he worked with possessed differing ranges of the geographical expertise, but all, ex all possessed, quote, the most minute topographical knowledge of a certain part of the country. As guides moved beyond their own territorial boundaries, however, he noted that the country is, perfect to, is a perfect terra incognita to them, which they neither need nor care or have the curiosity to explore. Custer's statement is a bit bizarre, but it acknowledges the ways that indigenous territories and boundaries mattered, even as he worked to try and create colonial borders on top of them. And if Custer would hesitate to hire indigenous women, he displayed no such reluctance with indigenous men. On July 14th, he'd gather a party consisting of 11 indigenous people, two white men, every one of the quote, Indians loaded with pack about 50 or 60 pounds. And the ratio of indigenous workers to white surveyors should give you pause. 11 indigenous people, three white workers. Without indigenous participants, the party of 14, which was supported by more than 600 pounds of supplies, became a party of three very hung hungry, very undersupplied surveyors who are trying to go up a mountain. So Britain and the United States desired to use the boundary survey to project, to project federal power onto local communities. The men who actually did this in practice learned a conflicting lesson through experience. Local knowledge made national borders. Surveying equipment had all kinds of powerful applications, but could not select optimal routes or approaches. For that, Custer relied heavily on his Stalo guides. Without these guides, Custer worried he would have to turn to white settlers who are, quote, this is his words, unused to travel in the woods and are sure to select always the most awkward place of the north. By the time Custer planned his trip along the Whatcom Trail, he'd employed indigenous guides and laborers for several months. He expressed his gratitude for their efforts, emphasizing the almost incredible amount of labor that may be gotten out of them when treated with respect. So the boundary survey didn't bother to record consistently the names of tribe of the indigenous laborers, guides, packers, and navigators that they relied on. But do not hesitate to recognize the value of their work to the project's success. The Coast Salish offered laborers to the boundary team on good faith. Colonial officials rarely lived up to the expectations the Coast Salish placed on them in return. Neither Britain nor the United States consulted the Coast Salish when designing the border and showed little interest in consulting them about it after the survey. Local knowledge might have underwritten the success of the boundary survey, but Britain and the United States would soon forget about it. They dreamed of federal governments who monopolized what borders meant and how they affected the indigenous systems or territory and governments. So that's the first section. Um, so that comes early on in the book. Uh, the second section comes at the very end of the book. So after the border has been created and it zooms in on everyday life. So the section that you just heard is how you actually build a border in practice and some of the logistics of it. Um, the, the section uh, that I'm gonna follow up with is about what that border means to individual people all across, all across North America. And it's uh, a section that is particularly meaningful to me because I came into this book project with some uh, large misconceptions about what archival work looked like. So I, I really wanted to rebuild what everyday life on the border felt like. And I thought, what better place to turn to than 19th century diaries? Um, so if you've ever been to an archive, you know that they, they provide a little summary of a person's life, where they went, uh, where their family members went. And so I knew these people had borders as all parts of their life. They were born in one country, they were educated in another, their brothers went off to a different country. They're, you can just see through their biography that they're constantly moving. And I could see that they were, they kept diaries for their entire life in the final minutes. And I thought, this is wonderful. I'm gonna book my archival trip. We're done this section of the book. I just need to show up and start reading this. And you get there. And for those of you who have used diaries before, this is heartbreaking. You open the book and you flip to a page and it's like uh, June 5th, you know, 1906, the day that they found out their brother died um, in, in a foreign country. The weather is sunny. 
you're like, all right, all right, you know, maybe, maybe they didn't write that day. And you, you flip another day, it's like rainy, windy, sunny, sunny. Oh boy. <laughs> you're like, okay, but you know, rough time of life, you know, they, they filled something out. And so you're like, I, I, have, I have boxes of these diaries. They, they bought these diaries, which were expensive at the time. Every day they filled them out and it's just the weather. And you're like, okay. You're like, just shake it off. You know, that was one bad diary. This person loves the weather. If I was an environmentalist going, this would be great, but I'm not. All of them. <laughs> Every diary I open. Just one after another. And so that was very frustrating, as you can imagine. You've flown to a different country in some cases. You've, you're, you know, you're in an archive. And the diaries just didn't have the kinds of things that I was hoping they would. I later found a lot of that material in um, family correspondence, which actually um, tends to be the places that people actually talked about that. But the other challenge I was running into was when people talked about the border, they only talked about uh, conflicts. But as many of you know, most border crossings happen differently, but no one takes the time to write them down. And so the section that I'm going to read uh, to you from is about a really exceptional woman, uh, Gracie Countryman, who actually wrote about border crossings gone well. That is one of the, the only person I found in 10 years who described normal border crossings. As crazy as that sounds, so if you have a diary and you would like future historians to thank you, please write some of your normal day down. Most people just write about the, you know, the, the ruptures, about you know, arrests, things like that. Um, so in honor of that moment where I was just so grateful, this was right at the end of the book, where I finally found someone who wrote in their diary, first of all, about the border, and most importantly, border crossings gone well. So that's where the section set, second section is going to come from. Gracia Countryman was an unusual woman. Born in Hastings, Minnesota in 1866, she would receive her education at the University of Minnesota at a time when few women entered higher education. Well-educated and determined, she worked as a cataloger for the Minneapolis Public Library before becoming the head librarian in 1904. Now, Countryman traveled throughout her entire life. She'd visit France and Spain, England, the United States, and Canada. She moved for pleasure and for work. In 1934, she set out from Wisconsin to explore Montreal and Prince Edward Islands with some of her friends, including the Canadian-born Marie Genevieve and others. And on the trip, the women would purchase fur coats, they dined in fancy restaurants, and enjoyed hot, hot baths at local resorts. They attended events with the Honorable John MacDonald and Chief Justice of Prince Edward Island, among others. And illness and dust, cold, minor car accidents would dampen the women's spirits, but would not overshadow an otherwise positive experience. As the women traveled east, Friendships, rather than the international lines, would dictate the direction of their travel. The border offered little barrier between their lunch at St. John's, Michigan, and a visit to one of Mary Genevieve's friends in Exeter, Ontario, later that night. Stops at Exeter, Port Hope, and Greenwood Towers to visit friends would punctuate long stretches of driving. While many of countrymen's contemporaries kept records of their travels, Few took time to note uneventful border crossings. Countryman was different. She gave voice to the mundane and forgettable, including a rare glimpse into border crossings gone well, at least as experienced by a woman of wealth and education. At Port Huron, for example, countrymen noted we had, quote, no trouble with customs and started straight for London, Ontario. The crossing at the St. Croix River 22 days later brought a minor snag. Uh, immigration and customs, for example, insisted that countrymen pay duty on a hooked rug which she brought that she had bought in Quebec. But quote, it was only a dollar and I was willing. Still, the border crossing delayed us a good deal, and it was dark when we started out. The delay at the border forced the women to abandon their earlier plans to reach a camp 11 miles away. They chose instead to spend the night at the Freeling Farm, quote, a delightful old place filled with old furniture and two delightful hostesses. By the time the women awoke, a wonderful breakfast and a beautiful view out of Passamaquoddy Bay made the earlier inconvenience at the border seem distant. By the end of the day, the roaring waves, large pine and spruce trees, fresh blueberries, fried clams, and baked mackerel 
had rendered it all but forgotten. Zelay's countrymen's party experienced near St. Croix had no impact on the women's future travel. They continued to zigzag across the border whenever they desired. Like their earlier crossing at Port Huron, their future interactions with the border often took, quote, only a moment. For a border that had cost so much time and energy to create, it seemed insubstantial against the magnificence of Niagara Falls and the fresh, delicious fruits the women continued to enjoy. Although unintuitive, countrymen's experience helped signal the border's growing significance rather than its chronic anemia. By the 1930s, the border had become natural for, for women like countrymen. Even when it acted as a trifling impediment, however, the border was always in the background. It was there, but not absent. Many others experienced the border as countrymen did as a minor but present part of life. By 1927, 60% of the 25,000 Canadians living in the in Windsor area actually worked in Michigan. Born in 1906 on the Chippewa of the Thames Reserve near London, Ontario, Carl Lewis experienced the mobility firsthand. In 1913, Lewis's family moved to Windsor. Three years later, at the age of 10, he found himself attaching lamp wicks at the Ford Motor Plant in Detroit. Cities like Windsor, Walkerville, Sandwich operate as part of Detroit's larger metropolitan area, more often than they did as independent cities of their own. The scale of integration between Detroit and Windsor had few peers, but other border cities replicated the principle. Until the 1950s, the Canadian city of White Rock, for example, relied on the fire prevention services from neighboring towns like Washington State, right? The, the fire engines are crossing borders to put out fires. That's how integrated these places are. Americans who migrated to Canada would maintain their connections back home. Family correspondence and newspaper subscriptions would link, link distant parts of the continent together. When prairie fires burned down the homes of American immigrants in Canada, they'd call on their family members in the United States for support. Marriage patterns would keep these connections alive. Young men from the Lummi area, for example, would look for eligible mates across the border. On September 7, 1907, Edward Warbus, a 24-year-old Lummi from Washington, married Roseanne, Rosanna Frank, a 15-year-old Skagit woman from British Columbia. By 1916, Joseph Jefferson, James Reed, William Moore, and others all married across the Washington-British Columbia border. These marriages would link the Tulalip, the Lummi, the Colville living in Washington, the Kedji, Mesquim, Shemanus, Iaxa, and others living in British Columbia. The choices of Indigenous women intensified a situation already overburdened with complexity. The marriage of Helen Payne of Muckleshoot to Yu Kagami, a 29-year-old citizen of Japan, would provide a reminder of the fictions of racial and national clarity that federal administrators were trying to enforce. Or to put it more simply, I guess, federal officials for all their power could not draw clean lines among race, nationality, tribal rights, or citizenship. While many of the transnational connections occurred in areas adjacent to the border, distance alone wouldn't dictate the way people moved or the ways people connected. By the time Sidonia Elizabeth Black was 37 years old, she had lived in Missouri where she was born, as well as California, Manitoba, and Minnesota. She had relocated to Winnipeg with her husband, Alf Albert Black, during World War I so that he could escape the draft. Once there, she found herself at home within the significant African-American community. If national policy had motivated her to move to Canada, it would be sadness and family that gave inspiration for her return. After having a falling out with her husband, she returned to Duluth, where her sister lived. The stories of countrymen, Orbis and Black, demonstrated the possibilities that had coexisted with a new kind of border that Canada and the United States had created. Pleasure travel, and opportunities for work remained. So too did connections to family. Still, for all the personal histories that depicted the border as invisible and insignificant, many others suggested the ways it shaped their movements and lives. Social divisions echoed national lines, creating barriers that extended into the streets, into the offices, and the playgrounds of both countries. It was day-to-day -day interactions that would embed birthplace, mobility, and ethnicity into the fabric of everyday life. Social slights would soon carry a national overtone. 
When Alf Fleischer traveled from Iowa to Saskatchewan in 1914, he noted, quote, that most of the big shots in Regina were English and considered themselves above American farm people. Snubs to American-born farmers sat poorly with men like Weischer, who believed that Americans represented the demographic majority in some parts of Canada. Their social standing, he inferred, should reflect the size of the population. And Weischer would not experience these insults alone. Josephine Handy Gridall had visited Canada twice before her family had relocated there while she's a young girl. And her peers teased her relentlessly on her arrival. She used American terminology, words like writing tablet and overshoes, instead of their Canadian equivalents, words like scribblers and galoshes. But her family's position in the community shielded her, shielded her from further abuse. When she complained about the teasing she had experienced to her grandfather, he told her that, quote, if any of those teachers or kids aren't nice to you, you just tell them they can't have water out of grandpa's well. And that was the end of it. She didn't have trouble after that. The well, which the community relied on, provided social protection for Gridal as she transitioned to a new social dynamic north of the line. As Gridal's and Weischer's stories suggest, everyday interactions shaped how individuals understood their relationship with national spaces. Insults would remain fresh decades later, long after the mundane border crossings were forgotten. By infiltrating everyday life, Local understandings of the border helped to curtail mobility well beyond the immediate capacity of either government. Indirectly, and at a distance, fear would prevent journeys before they even begin. So too would hassle. In 1931, Mary McCall visited her family in Oregon. And while there, she noticed an absolute abundance of food vis-a-vis -vis the sparsity that she knew in Saskatchewan. Her cousin noted that much of the food in Oregon remained unsellable, and simply went to waste, it just rotted. The cousin confided that if it wasn't for the international boundary and customs between us, we would ship you carloads of food into your neighborhood. McCall's approach to her food shortages emphasized how imposing a border the barrier could seem. Instead of trying to find a way to bring food from her, uh, from her family members up across the border, she instead looks for parallel opportunities in Canada. She began a letter writing campaign to British Columbia, which she believed might have a similar surplus of crops. In doing so, she looked to solve the problem within the nation state, rather than reaching beyond it where there are clear possibilities that she knew existed. So if the border presented an economic barrier to McCall's charity, it had an almost ethereal presence for others. Edward Dienst had moved from Illinois to Saskatchewan in 1908 on a doctor's recommendation of all things. Perhaps his asthma would clear up in a, a drier climate. According to Dienst, he started to feel better right away. Quote, at the border, you might say. The air seemed to be different, light and everything, and I started to improve and get better. Dienst me measured the border in terms of air quality, Gridal as childhood bullying and McCall as an impediment to charity. Attempts to centralize the border's administration had done little to destroy the fractured ways that people identified themselves with respect to national lines. Even within settler communities, the border came to mean different things for different people, a common word to describe endless possibilities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ben, that was wonderful. Um, we have an opportunity now to ask him some questions. Uh, this is uh, part of what we hope for this evening, that there will be some engagement between our audience, and then this is a really thought-provoking book, and lots of, and I'm glad you shared such rich uh, sections with us this evening, lots of um, little people involved in this massive project and how it impacts their lives, and I would invite you to ask some questions now, and if not, I'll be forced to ask my questions. So that's always a spur for you to ask more interesting questions than me. I can bring around this microphone if anyone has any questions, just flag me down. But don't be scared by that, because we're a relatively small crew here, and I'm sure we can hear you. So I know the microphone strikes fear in many people. So. Ben, I wonder if you could talk about how you came to this project in the first place. Uh, Saskatoon is one of the rare cities in the country that's a long way from the border. 
Um, and it wouldn't be an intuitive topic to choose here, but I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so in, in many ways, you would think that this was a natural topic for me. So I was born in Canada, immediately left for the United States, went back to Canada, back to the United States, back to Canada before I was in grade five. Um, so I have dual citizenship, so I've moved across the border relatively freely. Um, but I actually had no interest in studying borders until uh, somewhat recently. Uh, I got involved with this project working on censuses, trying to trace people's movements. I've always been interested in movements in a broad sense. And I started with what I thought was a, a really simple question that I was just curious about, which was, what is a border and how does it work? And I thought this was going to be like a one or two day project. Uh, and then a week went by and I was like, oh, no. I don't, I don't know how to answer this because every book that I read, I heard a very different story. Books on um, Chinese immigrants along the border had almost nothing in common with settlers. Um, each of the indigenous groups that you read about in the border had a fundamentally unique and different experience. When you read reports about customs, they looked very different than when you read them about immigration. And so I sort of fell into this project trying to figure out why this single border that's a single uh, line of even thickness across that just separates nations on maps seemed to mean a thousand different things to every group that I seemed to look at. Um, and so that was the goal of this book was trying to bring together hundreds of different studies and, and pieces of research from all of the different administrative bodies that are involved in border control, dozens of different groups and communities and try and figure out why it is that the border treated people differently. Why, you know, in the pieces of the border that we, we are stuck with today, where did those come from? So I was, I was, that's sort of where the genesis of this came from was me thinking I had a simple question and found out very humbly that I had absolutely no idea um, for the next 10 years how that was gonna to fit together. Many historians that are smiling by a comment, we've all gone down that route. Thanks a lot, Ben. Uh, if you were to take this book in volume two, what, what do you think some of the most interesting dynamics in order since the end of the period that you studied? You know, my sense is that in some ways it's hardened a lot, especially since 9-11, but there were still a huge amounts of marijuana going from British Columbia to Washington State, and so Washington State started to legalize marijuana, you know, uh, disrupted the economy. You know, like when I was living in British Columbia in the 90s, that was the third or fourth or fifth in the sector of the economy. And everybody knew people were going from that sector of the economy. Um, so obviously, it only hurt to a certain extent. So uh, that kind of jumps out to me. But what are some of the other things that have changed in this border in the past half century or something? Yeah, so that's a, a really good question. So one of the obvious ones is technology. Um, much of the time period I'm talking about, you're patrolling the border on horseback, and it is a big border. And for some of this time, you had two people in charge of guarding much of the Canadian, uh, much of the border from um, like Calgary to almost Toronto. You can imagine that is that's just that's not happening, right? Um, so one of the big changes is you know the, the use of uh, motion sensing and heat sensing remote drones, that lets you address one of the fundamental challenges of border control, which is you can make a border almost impassable. You look at North Korea, South Korea, people still cross, but they have landline fields and you know, like that's about as tight as a border gets. But that's really expensive. That's unbelievably expensive, not only because you have to put down all the landlines and station soldiers there constantly, but you have no commerce. And so I think that's one of the big sort of fundamental shifts is how do you build a border without absolutely destroying all of these economic pieces? And so one of the one of the changes that I think is really interesting is the rise of the internet, where no longer are you policing physical movement. You know, someone can telecommute to a job without ever getting out of their seat um, in Saskatoon. That really, I think, changes the, the nature of borders, airports as well. Airports are little mini border crossings, if you think about them like that. So instead of one long border, now you have these speckled borders spread throughout an entire country. 
Um, and so they will look back into history to figure out how do you police airports? Well, you look at uh, shipping ports, which served a similar kind of nature. Uh, so that would be one, one of the areas that I'd be really interested in following is how they took some of the lessons they learned before 1930 for things like ports, for areas where they just, they don't want to have enough people or they don't want to disrupt economies. And sort of the legacies of that throughout time as they're addressing things that weren't really issues at that time period, like marijuana or the internet or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Oh, it's, a very, it's a simple sounding question, but can you expand on the meaning of the title along with language? Yeah, so this is a, like, I guess a funny story. This was my probably 30th choice for title. Um, I had I had what I thought was a really wonderful title, which was my dissertation, which was a wall of many heights. I love the title, but you're not allowed to name your dissertation the same as your book. Graduate students in the audience not allowed, so save your good title for the book. Um, and so uh, we, the publisher and I sat down, and, and really they were they were really kind and generous to go through a lot of time with me to talk about you know what a title um, indicates. Uh, and I liked a, a, a line of blood and dirt um, because blood, I think, carries two different meanings. One is a, a meaning of family, and one is a meaning of violence. And for me, those two pieces were always a part of this border. That's that's what make this border what it is today. Um, so I, I wanted something like blood and then dirt, mostly because of the land, um, the way that it's sort of abstracted. And then the sort of uh, subtitle was in all sort of the variations, but I wanted to remind people that this was, that, he, that borders are never built on empty land. You're always drawing borders across existing territorial boundaries and that boundary making, border making, and nation making, this is as much about trying to erase what came before as it is about what other things up. And I think we miss that and forget that. And so that was uh, why the subtitle reads, building borders across indigenous lands, because there are hundreds of borders long before the Canada-US border uh, and I think you miss a, a really important part of our nation's story without that piece. And I wonder if you could comment on how the pandemic, in fact, you were finishing this book uh, during the first year or so of the pandemic, uh, impacted you as a historian of the border, you know, something that we never thought would happen, the U.S.-Canada border closing happens. And, and how did that cause you to reflect on this topic? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, one of the big changes was it expanded the ways I travel. Um, I, I never physically left my, my house, uh, which sucked, but I was giving talks in Edinburgh and Germany, giving talks in Montreal. I gave more book talks than I think I probably should have. And then most people get the opportunity to talk because the logistical challenge of actually flying me to Edinburgh or flying me to Montreal, that had disappeared. Everyone had gotten very used to um, to Zoom. And so I, would, I ended up connecting with people I never would have. Um, and it was sort of a mixed bag. This is the first time I think I've talked about this book in person, um, which is somewhat exciting for me. Um, but it's probably the 50th talk I've given on this book. And that's, I think, one of the big legacies of COVID is I was able to reach an audience in a way that I never thought possible, even though I couldn't visit my family members in the States. And so it's this weird divide where parts of the world seemed to open up for me and other parts closed. And that's why I was, when I answered Jim's question, I think if I was writing sort of follow-up to this, technology would really change, I think, how I wrote and thought about the border as he moved, especially uh, post-1990 uh, and even more so post-2010. Uh, I think it's really put a lot of pressure on what it means to be a nation when no longer is it just about demarcating territory. Now it's about controlling access to information, technology. Um, for those of you who have VPNs to legally get Netflix from the United States, you know what I'm talking about. You don't enter the United States, but you're getting American television, right? With the flip of a switch, you've now switched countries. And that I think has really profound implications to how we think about borders. I have a question from a virtual viewer. Uh, they ask, what did you discover about Big Bear's people and the Montana Cree? Were you able to identify who some of those people were? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, parts of this, so I guess the quick answer is one of my students wrote an amazing MA thesis on Big Bear uh, 
the Big Bear People's Movement um, into Montana. So if you're interested in sort of reading a really wonderful and short rendition of that story, uh, her name is Tyler Betke. She's currently a PhD student at Carleton. Um, so the, the short answer is, I guess, yes. Um, there is a really fascinating census uh, that's created around the Rocky Boy Reserve that tells you a lot about boundary movement. So for those of you who don't know, Big Bear's people will relocate following uh, some horrific episodes of violence. And it, they become essentially um, refugees from Canada. And Canada, I think, tries to pride itself on being the home where refugees come, but it also produces situations that are, that are just untenable to live in. Uh, many of them will relocate uh, to Rocky Boy Reserve and the surrounding area in Montana. And when that reserve is being created, off the top of my head around 1915, um, the Indian agent in charge realizes he doesn't, he doesn't, he's not been given the funds to include everyone who should be on this, this reserve. And so he intentionally excludes all of the uh, all of the men and women that he believes could get jobs. Uh, thinking that you know, if he only has a limited amount of money, he should be supporting the elderly, children, uh, people who can't care for themselves. And so that that moment of border violence which pushes people across, and then the expulsion, and then the return of, of many of the Chippewa and Cree becomes this this sort of crazy moment where people's identity all the way up until today is being decided by an Indian agent with a limited budget who's excluding people who would be otherwise part of the community. Um, and that's had profound ramifications for where people ended up today, who they consider family. Um, it's, it's a really uh, hard story. Um, the Big Bear community was running um, public events up until the pandemic and the death of Terry Atomoyo or COVID, uh, which is a very sad story. He was bringing together people from all of the 15 or 20 different reserves that the Big Bear people had ended up on to come together and share stories about their experiences around the border. Um, I went to a few of them. Um, many of the presentations are given in Cree, um, sharing these oral histories that they're, they're preserving, trying to rebuild this band that even today, um, this is decades later, almost a century later, are still reeling from, and still recovering from, um, these decisions that were made in the 1880s, 1890s, 1910s. So uh, if you're interested, Tyler Becky has a wonderful MA thesis. It's free to read. Uh, it's online through the University of Saskatchewan site. Um, does a really wonderful job of talking about that difficult uh, story. It's not too much in my book um, because I wanted to give Tyler some room to do her own thing. Thanks. I know you asserted that you're not an environmental historian, but I wanted to speak for a minute about how the environment kind of shaped that process. Yeah, so, yeah, not an environmental historian, but like you say, I think the environment is a big part of boundary making. Um, and the, the most obvious way that you can see this is the order in which they, they build the border. So if you were thinking, I'm going to build a border, I'll start on the East Coast and I'm just gonna build the border until the West Coast. That would make sense, but that's not how they do it. So they do all the East Coast and they're like, huh, do not wanna do the prairies. Well, let's do the West Coast. And then years and decades pass. And then only, only at the end do they decide that they wanna do across the middle. And some of this is they're worried about water. So you can imagine you're going into lands that you do not know. And you have all this great surveying equipment, but that doesn't tell you where rivers are doesn't tell you where potable water is. It doesn't tell you where food or animals are. Right? You need guides for that. And so that becomes one of the last areas that they do, the final one being obviously up north in, in Alaska and Yukon. Uh, so that's one of the obvious ways is this fear of geography will shape the order in which people move and immigrate, but also the order in which the border is built. But you also see this with the decline of animal populations, or SAF, and many plains groups, so the kind of military strength they might have previously had. And a lot of the battles initially over the border are over resources. And one of the sort of uh, most comical, I guess, is in British Columbia over fish. So fish have this awful habit of not caring where humans draw borders. And so some years they'll, they'll cross into British Columbia's waters and British Columbian fishermen can fish. 
And in one particular year, the fish, for whatever reason, decided they didn't like that anymore. And they stayed south of the border. And Canadian fishermen were not having peace. And I don't know if it was water temperatures or what, but the fish just wouldn't come. And so they would, all of these uh, British and uh, Canadian fishermen crossed south of the border to grab their fish. And the Americans are like, ah, oh, you can't do this. And so they started arresting and pounding all these boats. It became such a serious issue that Britain negotiated with the United States for that year and that year alone. The border would move, I think it was two miles south on the maritime area so that British fishermen could get into the water. Um, so you can see the ways that nature is often very frustrating when you try and draw abstract lines and the ways that colonial governments sometimes have to, to nudge or shift things to make them practical to everyday life. Question oh, thank you. Oh, I was just wondering if you encountered any like changes to even the living in the US, like imagination of the nation because of this board, especially like everyday people. And, um, was there more of like a Canadian those foreign in the construction of this as a more, uh, more solidified or in fact um much more aggressive. Yeah, uh, a great question, Dennis. Um, so one of the, the big challenges with building a border is borders are about who belongs. They're about citizenship, they're about mutual okay. economies and things like that. And early on in the border's creation, Britain had a very strong stance uh, around uh, citizenship and nationality. So if you were born British, you stayed British. You, you couldn't just change your citizenship or your nationality. This becomes a really big issue in the War of 1812 uh, and some other places where Britain would simply you know, take American sailors and say, great, you're British sailors now, we need you in the Navy. We don't really recognize that you're, that you're a different place. And so this becomes just a, a colossal sticking point early on over can you naturalize? Can you change who you are? Or is, is the circumstances of your birth what fundamentally dictates who you are, where you belong, what opportunities are available to you? And that I think gets beaten out of Britain very slowly over the span of 50 or 60 years as conflict after conflict arise. And I think they come to the conclusion that maybe leaving it to a person's choice might be a more effective way. Right? Forcing people to stay in your country doesn't make for loyal subjects. Um, and some of that's the change in, in the military dynamic on the continent and other things like that. So you do see shifts in imagination. But I think what's really interesting is even if you look at a, the same time, same place, very few people start off in agreement about what borders you need. And that I think surprised me even more was, even if you control for you know, economic status and all of these things, there's just very little agreement. And I think that's one of the reasons why borders are so difficult to study. Um, they, they just seem to fracture identities in thousands of different ways. Time for perhaps one more question. Um, the different thing came in terms of, you know, so the next to the U.S. border is over the Um, and I, but I'm wondering in terms of the way that this sort of underground economy becomes really, really popular and actually necessary parts of the U.S. to even operate. Is, is there something like that happening in terms of an underground economy that you see in the way in the sources between Canada and the United States? Yeah, so one of the sort of famous stories is about prohibition. Um, but it, it gets kind of silly where neither country really wants alcohol creation at certain years. And so Canada will pass laws saying you can manufacture alcohol, it just can't stay here. Knowing that the only place it's going is to the United States, which also doesn't want alcohol. Um, but it becomes such an important part of Canadian manufacturing that they're they're reluctant to let things like that go, even when it would be beneficial to both parties. The other sort of place that some of these come into play is, is things like fishing. So in British Columbia, um, they don't allow fish traps. So these are sort of like, imagine like giant lobster traps. So these just sort of sit in the ocean, fish swim into them, and they're really, uh, really fast catch fish. You just literally go into the pound, you dump, you, you like bucket out fish, just fish for days. Canada didn't allow them. The Canadian fishermen got really wise, which was just like a hundred meters that way is all of these fish crowded into these nets. And if I go at night 
It just so happens that I can fill all of my nets up with way less work than going out into the ocean. And so you get this, this huge underground economy of raiding American fish traps just across the border. And so you, you imagine the American uh, fishermen are like, okay, fine, we're gonna station people with guns on our traps at night. But the problem is how much do you pay those people? Because if you bribe someone who's getting, you know, a little over minimum wage-ish for a month today, with hundreds and hundreds of dollars and you fill up your entire boat worth of fish, it's still a pretty good deal for you. And so you have all of these underground economies of moving goods, moving people, smuggling Chinese immigrants um, after the Chinese Exclusion Act becomes a big money enterprise. Many of the things that you see today, so trafficking of goods, people, um, counterfeiting sheet music of all things, there are taxes and tariffs on that. Uh, maybe my favorite example is, um, is this wonderful court case where the Hudson's Bay Company gets really upset because many American firms open up the Hudson's Company, the Hudson's Bay Fur Company, every variation you can think of, like dozens of them. And they, they brand them almost the same as the Hudson's Bay Company in the States. And so it launches this big sort of series of lawsuits trying to get people to stop impersonating it and selling you know, low quality things. And so you see almost every sort of violation, almost every kind of weird thing that you could imagine today, uh, people will do uh, just unbelievable underground economies happening basically all over the time. Our formal part of our um, evening is over, it's up now, um, but I know that Ben will be willing to stay around. Uh, there's a pile of books there, those of you who haven't had the pleasure of reading this yet uh, and uh, have had your appetite wedded, please buy one and have Ben sign it for you. I want to thank all of you for being here tonight, but I also want to thank you, Ben. This was really great, and it was wonderful to have an opportunity to engage with you about the book and ask some questions. And I know some of you still have questions that you'd like to ask him, but you didn't want to ask in front of everybody. So please feel free if you want to ask those questions now. So please join me in thanking Ben Boy once more for this reading this evening and the q session. Like to say a quick thank you again to Ben and Valerie for being here tonight and to Oxford University Press. Um, as she said, uh, Ben will stick around and sign books. I've got a table just over there, and we've got copies of the line of blood and dirt available right over there. So um, thank you for joining us tonight and please be careful and nice. <laughs>